Most apartments in Portland in general, most commercial properties, multifamily properties, the landscaping consists of the minimal, easy to maintain landscape. Basically, it's usually just paved parking spaces. And grass. It's basically, if it's not parking space, it's grass or there's a sprinkling of ornamental shrubs. You know, they don't produce any fruit or anything. So, I mean, it's a tragedy. It's a, kind of a lost opportunity. If somebody changed that model, I mean, the place could become like this, this sort of one giant food forest. Hey, Stephen. Everybody knows everybody, and people eat together, and party together, and garden together. Hey, Neil. Yeah. They're actually where we meet each other more than anything else is gardening together. Honestly, yeah, this squash is kind of, I think. Like, Looks like you have some sage some there, sage, or yeah, herbs, I was just yeah. about to say, I always okay. want to call it lavender for some reason, but it's oh, sage. Yeah, right, yeah. I've been in Portland since the 1990s and we've been on the sustainability trip, but it's all been sort of individual family, you know, household doing gardening and composting and things like that. Have a good one. Eventually, we wanted to develop a community. So this seemed like a great place to try this out. It was a kind of a rundown apartment building back in 2007. Uh, imagine 14 or 15 years ago, this was a giant parking lot and there was just gra crew cut grass on either side of that. So when we started, the grounds were totally bare. Okay, grass, we're talking grass, pavement, and a few ornamental shrubs that were pretty pathetic. No fruits or anything like that. So let's walk into the circular garden. But it had a big space for garden. So right here is the center. And what makes a circular garden so unique is that from this one point, you can irrigate a vast area very, very easily. This space is gardened by our group gardens program. We have about 20 families gardening together and growing things that you wouldn't normally grow in your own individual garden plot. For example, squashes. You can see a lot of space is taken up by squash, and you wouldn't have that space to do something like that in your own garden. Okay, we have carrots and peppers sunflowers, chard, cabbage, cauliflower, and broccoli. You can kind of see the fruit trees here. Look at the fruit trees, they're just totally loaded. These are the ground falls that we picked up so far. And they may look a little dubious, but actually these are great for apple pies, apple sauce. You can dry these too if you wanted to. So we get a huge bounty of fruits here. And you planted all these? We planted all these, yeah, right. So when we started out, this was just grass here uh, in the, the planting strips. And from here up to the building was a parking lot in the middle and then grass and gravel on each side. There were a few ornamental shrubs right at the base of the building, but it was essentially just a big open kind of dead space. And you can see once you depave, we depaved the parking lot there and now it's a fabulous garden, right? So did you buy? So we bought it, yeah. So we worked with a bank. You've got to convince a bank to put the money behind because it's a huge investment. This was $1.7 million. This was considered a kind of a high risk investment. So they required a 30% down payment. Behind you, I wanted to point out that this is our intersection repair. So two years ago in August, we got together as a community, we closed the street at both ends, and then we painted this pollinator themed street painting. That, that's one of the, the, the fun community projects. Builds community. We learned a lot of our neighbors, we had a lot of our neighbors that we'd never met before. Really a great community building project. So we need a garden space because that's key to permaculture is having some space where you can plant different things, trees and annual plants and things like that. So we decided to utilize one of the local organizations called Depave. Depave, their mission is to remove parking lots and turn, turn those spaces into garden spaces. So we worked with them. We had probably 40 volunteers here one day and we pried up all the asphalt 
and hauled it off. We filled up like nine dumpsters full of asphalt. Then we discovered a gravel layer and actually a house foundation underneath. You never know what you're going to find when you depave some space, but undaunted, we continued on. We removed the, the house foundation, removed all the gravel, and started gardening. And this is 10 years later or so. The soil is very fertile. We probably created this much topsoil uh, on top of the previously just bare areas. So I mentioned we depaved this space. One of the amazing things, this was parking lot right here. We discovered this old um, concrete pond that was hidden under the, the pavement and long forgotten. So when we discovered this, we decided we'd remodel it. And look at what we've got now, these gorgeous cattails out of a pond that was essentially hidden and buried under the pavement for probably 50 years that we then unearthed and now have returned back to pond. It's a beaut, it's a water feature, but it also provides a mud source for certain insects that use mud to create their homes like mason bees and mud dauber wasps. Also swallows use mud to make their mud nests. So this is a perpetual source of mud that they can tap into. Now behind this is our well. So you'll see that little square structure with mm -hmm. the living roof. We actually have a 100-foot well there that we've drilled that we tap into a, the aquifer underneath that we replenish with the rainfall. Rather than using cisterns to store rainwater, we use the earth as our cistern and then tap it with a well. It percolates into the ground into this gigantic aquifer under the city of Portland, and then we tap into that. So we're replenishing the water that falls on the property here by keeping it in place. When we started this project, the driveway and the roof were sent into the sanitary sewer. So we were exporting rainwater to the city Bureau of Environmental Services, which then had to treat that when it's mixed with sewage. A big problem. We've avoided that problem or remedied that problem really by keeping the water on site, percolating it into the ground and replenishing the aquifer that we draw from. So the rain, is drained to each side of the building. You'll see a pipe coming from that side. Uh -huh. That channels all the rainwater from the north side of the building to that center, and then it comes across, and then it's uh, conveyed through these rain chains to fall around us here. So the building is split down the center. It's a kind of a gable roof. And so we get about 150,000 gallons that land on the north side of the roof. There's another 150 from the south side. So the building itself probably contributes 300,000 gallons. This is the north side rainwater, and because it goes through small orifices in front to channel it to the rain chains and other places, it's important to keep sediment, leaves, and things out. So what this does is it catches these leaves. Look how did a peanut get up on the roof? But <laughs> So several times a year, we'll go through and, and clean the filters out and basically you just tap them like that. Uh, and that way it keeps that material out of the rainwater chains, um, which would clog them. And you can put it back again. So whenever it rains, there are three waterfalls on this side of the building. What are you doing? I'm restoring the, the rainwater creek, we call it, you see, the stone. It goes all the way to the big swale, and it starts up here. When it rains, you see the black, the downspout. So the water goes down and comes out here in that stump, and then it starts to run all the way down there. So it's fun to come out here when it, there's a downpour. When we started, we had contemplated going into a co-housing, which is a condominium model. You co-own the place with a bunch of other people. The problem with that is we kind of do things a little bit radical, like human newer composting, composting our pee and poop. This is the basis for our fertility, and we figured your typical co-housing community would not necessarily go for that.
This is what we call the additive for our compost toilets. So we're importing carbon from the city, which normally would go in the landfill. Believe it or not, some people put this in the landfill. And yet this is exactly what you need to balance the high nitrogen inputs from urine and kitchen compost and excreta poop. Excrement, toilet paper, and additive are what we compost to create fertility and, and till. So let me... And this. everybody has a compost toilet. No. <laughs> so there's probably about a dozen of us who use the ecological sanitation project. Every unit, generally speaking, has a toilet in it. And some people will supplement with a bucket of wood chips and then a lovable loo next to it. And this is a typical one bedroom unit right here. So it's about 565 square feet, consists of this living area and a kitchen. And there's our bedroom. And then we also have the bathroom in here. And what's unique about our bathroom is we have a compost toilet in it. This is normally where the toilet goes right here, this hole that's covered in the floor. We've removed that because we have our own compost toilet here. And this is what a compost toilet looks like. This is called the lovable loo. It's a five gallon bucket that you pee and poop into. If you're willing to save your urine separately, that's even better and that's what I do. So I have my own pee bottle here. I just pee into my bottle. And my wife pees into her bottle using this contraption. So you see there's a little bottle there and a funnel. So very easy actually to collect your pee separately from your poop, okay? And it doesn't smell at all. There's no odors yeah. here, okay. So what's amazing uh, in between use is the wood chips that we use for covering. These are the wood chips. So after you pee or poop in here, then you cover with this. And wood chips are well known as an odor absorber and barrier. That leaves the interesting question about what happens when you're pooping. Yeah. Okay, there's odor that's coming into the room. So that's what this is right here. So when we come in here to poop, we turn on this fan. So now we actually have a fan that's inside here, sucking air into the lovable loo and then venting it into the attic space above. So when we're pooping, unlike toilets in any place in the world that I've ever seen, we have no odor. The state-of-the-art American toilets, the state-of-the-art Jap even Japanese toilets that are, can run several hundred dollars do not have this feature, and I'm not sure why. It smells so, like the forest. That's what you get with wood chips here. So these have a kind of an earthy smell. Very, very nice. So that's how our bathroom looks. And otherwise, we have a regular sink here and a regular shower. So we recycle pee in bottles. So I'm going to show you how we do it. So these are our urine tanks. Uh, and this is 1,000 liters or one cubic meter of urine right here. So you can see it's about to right there. We fill them up to 90% and then we move to the next tank. So I'm just going to uncap this. And you can see here we have a funnel and then a little cap with a rock on it to hold it. And I'm just going to dump this in very simply. Add my pee to the communal pee. And then to after six months, then here's where you drain the urine out. And typically what we do is we attach a pipe here. And you can, if you look over here, you can see that barrel down there, yeah. okay, with the hose coming out. Mm -hmm. So come on down here and I'll show you. This is what we do is we typically will attach a tank. In this case, that's attached to the urinal tank inside our urination station. So we drain that tank whenever it gets full into the barrel. And then inside the barrel, you can look over there and we have a sump pump that's connected to the hose. And that hose goes up to our compost area. So uh, we drain that tank into there and turn on the pump. And the, all the hose is pumped up to our kitchen compost area and we distribute it into the bins there. So you have enough space for uh, all the pee? Exactly, yeah, you right. It takes us about three months to fill a tank. So after the tank is filled, then you mark that it's finished, and then you have six months from that point. So after six months, the urine... So this is not, this is unaged urine. That's why you can compost that. It's not a problem. But 
you wouldn't normally use that directly on plants, and this is just to follow the technical rules. Unlike your own personal pea, that's a little bit different because it's your own organisms inside you. So this is my personal plot, and normally pea goes into the public urine depot, and then it's sanitized by the high pH. But if you use your pea on your own plot, you don't have to do that. So this is my personal pea, and I'm gonna show you what I do. I just dump it here. Very, very simple. And now pea can develop an odor. When it's fresh, it doesn't have an odor. So you wanna wash the leaves. This is just uh, well water. And then I go through and wash the, the foliage. That dilutes the pea as well as washes any urine off, and that way we don't have any odor ever. What's the property of pee in, in uh, so uh, what are you getting from okay, it? Okay, so yes. it's how we excrete most of the nutrients in our body that plants like. And the carbon obviously comes out in our feces, right? The pee, everything that's liquefied is in pee. And so it's minerals, potassium, phosphorus, magnesium, calcium, as well as nitrogen. So nitrogen comes out in the form of urea, and when it's broken down, the urea breaks into ammonia. The plants love the nitrogen. It's primarily a nitrogen source for gardeners. So otherwise you'd be buying inputs. Exactly, yeah. So if you garden, you know nitrogen can be a challenge because all plants need nitrogen. It's like the fundamental nutrient that all plants need besides oxygen and carbon dioxide. Only my tree manage and own this place. And at first, you know, I was a little frightened of them. I didn't know uh, what they were about. I wasn't sure if I was going to go along with it. But then as uh, they talked more and we uh, related to one another, I said, you know, I think I could go along with this, you know? And I cared about the environment, you know, and they cared about it a lot more. I've been here uh, 35 years. I watched it change from uh, dilapidation to uh, a grand forest. Yeah, I wouldn't live here if it was otherwise. Yeah. You know, if it was just a, a simple complex, I wouldn't be here. Here is our solar shower. This morning I actually tested it out with the smoke. We're not getting a lot of heat, but let me turn on the faucet here. And so it's on pure hot water, and I'm going to see if we get any. Yeah, we're actually getting a little bit. It's not really hot. So how it works is there's a solar collector on the roof there. That series of pipes absorb the heat. That contains about eight gallons of water that's heated up. The cold water comes in one side and it comes out hot at the other end. And then it's conveyed to the shower here. And we actually have a, a thermometer here that tells you what the temperature is of the incoming hot water. It's about 80 degrees right now. So it'll probably go up maybe close to 100. Now, one thing to note is you have to use biologically safe, low sodium soaps, otherwise it's gonna contaminate. This is a permitted gray water disposal system that we have here. So here's the conveyance pipe, actually. So we have two zones of gray water. This right here is the switch to go from one to the other. Move it from one side to the other. So now the water's going that way, or you can make it go that way, and then that's just the tightening. So this zone right here is this artichoke patch. So the water comes down here, goes across. This is the splitter. So half the flow goes that way, and half the flow goes that way. And this is another splitter. So when the water comes here, it splits it between these two sites. And this is where the water actually percolates into the ground. And the same, the water that's split there comes down and is split again here and goes to those two spots. So it moistens in four different spots. And there's a similar moistening down in this other plot. If we turn it this way, then this pipe goes down underground to here. The water is split and it goes to two spots there and two spots there. This is the kale patch here. So that's how the gray water works. Hey, Neil, yeah. would you like to meet Kirsten and? Hello. Hi, you're working hard. Yeah. <laughs> so Neil is our farmer. One of the bee farmer. <laughs> So he sells all our spare produce. We do thousands of dollars of sale at your mar farmer's market, right? <laughs> yeah. 
we have a lot of surplus here, so he sells all kinds of stuff. What do you sell? It? This week, figs, cleared out the figs, greens, kale, collards, chard, some cucumbers, Ollie's kale, this is Ollie's patch of kale. We grow for ourselves and then we realized we were growing more than we can eat, so we decided to start selling the excess. And you live here as well? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. How long have you lived here, Neil? It's probably 10 years. I took two years trying to live in rural area. The reason I got into food growing was because I recognized what was coming down the pipeline. What do you mean by that? As far as collapse, systemic collapse, you know, our financial collapse. So I wanted to learn to grow food and then have in place a system that could step in. We have water and mm. we have food and you know, everyone says the minute the collapse happened, I mean, we've seen it with the pandemic, like what was the first thing to disappear off the, with all the shelves? And people were afraid. And they were asking the farmers, what do you think? You know, they were looking for some sense of security that when the food distribution chains go down, that there will be local food, you know? So it was my first experience of what it's gonna be like when systems start going down. So this is our 1,500 gallon cistern. So typically a person needs a gallon a day uh, during an emergency. So we have 1,500 gallons divided by 50 residents. We have 30 days worth of emergency water. This is the group garden greenhouse. Right now it's kind of the low part of the season, but you get a sense of how utilitarian this space is. I don't know if you've heard of the Cascadia subduction earthquake zone. We're in this zone where it's not a question of if, it's a question of when we're going to get a Richter 9 earthquake, which is like one of the most catastrophic in human history. I mean, they come every 300 years in the Pacific Northwest. Usually they're accompanied by tsunamis. We don't have to worry about that. but. Uh, the ground is going to get shaken for probably upwards, a severe shaking for upwards of five minutes. That's going to break all kinds of grids. The power grid is likely to go down. The sewer grid almost undoubtedly. And it's probably going to be gone for months, if not years. It could take years to get the sewer system going again. This is our urination station. Despite the name, it's not just for urine. We actually have a regular lovable loo compost toilet inside. So that's why our eco-sanitation project, we have our own local permitted sanitation project here where we can actually keep going. Probably will become a nexus in the neighborhood where residents will be bringing us their buckets once they learn the two bucket system. And then also we have a men's urinal. Now there's a very simple device called the pee style that allows women to pee standing up. You know, that's probably a little bit out there, but from ecological circles, people are aware of that. Uh -huh so that you're not considered sexist by having a wall-mounted urinal. Yeah, so, uh, and then the urine here goes into the tank just behind. So it's actually connected to a pipe that goes into the barrel in the terrace down below. And then from there, we sump pump it to the compost station. Let's head down to the humanure compost courtyard. Okay. The difference for this setup here is there's a roof over every bin and the bottom of each bin has, is lined with a concrete pad that is sloped to a drain in the center. So the potentially pathogenic compost from human manure is totally sequestered from the environment. You can't have poop going into the groundwater, for example. The buckets are accumulating here. We wait until we have about 30 buckets and then about once a month, we empty all the buckets into one of the bins, rinse out all the buckets, and then let them dry out. So these are waiting to be refilled with fresh wood chips. And let me open up this bin right here. So they're hinged. It's entirely treated inside the bins for one full year, and then it's emptied out and put on ornamental plantings or fruit tree plantings. This is what the finished compost looks like, and it has a totally sweet smell. It just smells like earth, and it's totally pathogen-free. So it's been processed and sanitized and we also have the, the dates marked here. Okay. So. 20, yes. So 6, 5, 20. So that actually, we can now empty. It's been a year old. That's the bin that we're currently emptying and we're ready to move on to this bin. The bin we're currently filling then is in that corner and it hasn't have, doesn't have a date marked on it yet. 
So that's our echo sanitation project. And although only about a dozen of us are using the system right now, we're set up that if in an emergency we need echo sanitation, we can scale this up. This is actually rated for 19 full-time adults, uh, but it can absorb 60 adults for a few months. Hi, where are the hammocks? Oh, the hammocks are, <laughs> see those tall trees over there? They're clear over that side of the garden. Yeah. Uh, all right, now from, we're going to walk through our food forest, so you've got to crouch down here. It's a little bit, the branches are all laden down with plums, yeah, with fruit. Yeah. This was today's harvest of apples. These are Liberty Apple, which is a really great oh, wow. apple. We've probably created, I would say, about 10 centimeters of new soil over the entire property. So this is kind of the center of our food forest right here. We have the fruit trees, and then in between, there's sunny areas, so we grow different types of squash. So here are some butternut squashes here. There are many different varieties in here. And what you can see is, let's go down to here to the end. You'll see where, when the trees were planted 10 years ago, that was the original soil level right there. And about five or six feet away from it, the soil is probably that much deeper. This is all soil that we have constructed with our organic gardening activities. So you, you hear about topsoil loss. You know, there's also topsoil creation in organic gardening. It's sort of like the byproduct of organic gardening. So that also ties into global warming because this soil is created out of carbon. So we're sequestering carbon in the landscape in the form of soil. So this is actually regenerative agriculture. We're creating soil and storing carbon on site. Forests are like the original store of carbon and we've cut down so many of them now we need to reforest and this is a way of intermediate reforestation we have these growing new trees but we also have annual crops most of the crops we eat are annuals we don't do grains and yeah. beans here because we just don't have the space but we focus on fruits and vegetables which are really higher value crops this is soil that we're creating here those are leaves from rhubarb and the majority of farms are losing soil, right? Oh yeah, the Midwest has lost vast amounts of soil. So this is what a typical individual plot looks like. The individual can grow whatever they like here, and usually it's a combination of brassicas like this and other vegetables and flowers. Uh, you know, our monocrop farming systems are kind of an agricultural catastrophe. There's such a variety of things that are grown here. Check out this plot. Gosh, look at this, and look at this, tomato harvest, wow. Yeah, wow. And what happens is, the mouth of the Mississippi, there's this enormous dead zone from the excess nitrogen from chemical fertilizers. So nitrogen is fairly cheap, and it really stimulates the plants. It really jazzes up their growth. So the farmers put on way too much, and they get great harvest, but the topsoil is actually lost and depleted. Wow. Look at these pole beans but they keep jazzing up the growth year after year with these additives, and it's part of the collapse of our food systems. Is there anything called pest control? Do you need pest control or? Yeah, so what do we do for pest control? Okay, so we have, with our squashes here, they'll have squash beetles, and we just go through them and crush the beetles. So we grow a lot of cruciferous vegetables. We have a butterfly called the cabbage butterfly, but we also have paper wasps. The paper wasps sting the caterpillar and they feed their young with that. Yes. So we have paper wasps living all around the property and so those clear out the cabbage butterfly caterpillars and we have very minimal predation. The wasps are constantly keeping them under control. The same with birds and other natural pest controllers. Here's an example of some paper wasps right up there. Where? See that oh, yeah. little plywood board? I put that there to shield them from the people using the shower. So they're such a wonderful insect wildlife here. We just love them. We try and foster as much of this as we can. We have this bamboo hedge that goes along three sides of the property and it has a couple of functions. The main function, of course, is it creates a visual barrier. So we have sort of a, created our own privacy in our 
uh, Echo Village here. We can't really see the apartment next door. But it also creates all of this bamboo. Every year we have sprouts coming up. You'll see throughout the gardens there are trellises and uh, different types of projects made with our bamboo. We call it our microforestry project. We have three different kinds of bamboo. So this is the timber bamboo. And you can see how really heavy duty it is. Uh, one of our residents made a didgeridoo. How long did this take to grow? Okay, it's what's, huge. Okay, what's amazing is the sprout comes out and it's like this big around at the base and it's pointed. It goes from ground level to full height in six weeks. So it's growing literally three, four inches a day. So that's typical of all of the bamboo varieties that we have. They go from ground level to full height in a rapid growth spurt of six weeks and then the, the branches fall down and they leaf out. So these are this year, this is this year's. Let's see, we can see, yeah. So here's one. No, that one is one that's broken. Yeah, by now they've all leafed out. Is there any danger with bamboo with it, you know, being a pest or invasive and, and taking over or? You have to be very, very careful. We have a barrier on that side so it won't go to the neighboring property. And even then, it's jumped the barrier a couple of places, so we've had to take remedial action. Mm. So right up here, you can see through the fence mm. okay. into the neighboring property. So this is like a five-acre apartment complex here with 60 units. Uh, and there are a few trees around. You can't really see any grass right here, but look, they don't do anything with their landscape right here. This actually usually is full of weeds. I actually jump over there and weed it myself because it's, you know, it's part of our visual environment. But if you look down there, from here you can see there's grass down there. I see a few rose bushes, but there's no food production at all on this property. In that sense, it's a relatively sterile environment. Plants also do, and rich environments also do other things. For example, here the temperature dropped considerably. Yeah, you create really kind of a forest microclimate that is cooler and refreshing and uh, cools the whole city, actually, it really does. So cities, as we get to an era where we're going to have more extreme events, cities can do things that don't seem so high-tech, but at the same time they are the most high-tech, like planting trees could be... It is. It's amazing what design can do. And then there's also flowers and fruit that people are invited to pick here. We usually post signs, there's actually one right here, that says feel free to snack on any of the fruits. And the same goes for all of the fruit along the street here. <laughs> this is like the season for apples and pears, for sure. And kiwis. Cherries are done. You see the trees are totally bare of cherries. So there were no fruit trees here when you started? None. Zero. Zero. In fact, what's interesting is Portland's books don't allow fruit trees on the street side because of the mess they create if you don't pick the fruit. I mean, isn't that it's totally insane? What a perversion to not allow fruit trees because it can make a mess. And then the interesting thing here is our, our new tiny house. And you were allowed to? Well, the city of Portland allows one tiny house per single family dwelling. So we have a single family dwelling here. We don't exactly meet the codes here. Supposedly the house needs to be behind the facade, but it's a complaint driven system. And if nobody complains, you don't have any problems and it fits right into the community. It looks like it's been here forever. This was put in as just to have more space, more rental units. Right, so Gentiana has been bringing us her humanure for years living in a tiny house and she was being evicted. And we'd had this relationship for years because she was bringing her buckets here. So she said, can you help me out? And we thought about it and figured, why not? Let's try it. And we had this driveway here and the city allows one tiny house per single family dwelling. So we figured we'd do it. The irony is multifamily dwellings are not allowed to have tiny houses. And tiny houses are considered RVs. So you can imagine there's that sometimes negative, you know, connotation of RVs. You know, you ha the city has to deal with these politics <laughs> without getting into all the politics. It can be uh, sticky. 
But this thing just looks like it belongs here. It's a fairly big, tiny house, 190 square feet. They built it. How many people live in the house they built? And that's the thing with tiny houses. We've thought about putting a tiny house village in our parking lot, because our goal has always been to depave all the on-street car parking. And we can do that because Portland has this progressive policy of if you're within 500 feet of a high-frequency transit zone, you're not required to have off-street parking. We don't have to have any off-street parking here, which is really amazing because the zoning laws in America are so car-oriented, yes. so that's really very progressive. Yeah. So this house here was built in 1926. Years ago, the two properties were connected, and then we were able to reconnect them. And you'll see one of the themes of our gardening, we're of course permaculture oriented, but we put trellises and fences to grow vertical. So you can see this is laden with grapes. So most of the fences here, if not all, are trellises for grapes. Here we have different kinds of beans. Look at these oddball <laughs> beans, yeah. And then these are some kind of cucurbit squash. Looks like a spaghetti squash. So uh, coming down the, the driveway here a little bit. So we developed this as a passive house, meaning it's super insulated and airtight. So it's very, very energy efficient. It's like state of the art, comfortable in winter without using fossil fuels to keep you warm and cool in the summer. If it gets really, really hot, the insulation keeps the heat out also. So the bottom was a basement and we remodeled that as an accessory dwelling unit. So there are four bedrooms down there that we rent out rooms for. And th those folks have a, their own private kitchen and their own bath and everything. We call it the burrow, but it's got its own courtyard. And the downstairs has as many windows as upstairs. So you don't feel like you're in a dark basement. That's actually our freezer. When we lived in the upstairs here, we had all the space for a freezer. Since we moved to a one bedroom unit now, we don't have that space, but Amanda, who lives here with her kids, uh, we have an agreement and we pay her $100 a year for electricity. And then, I, and I'm coming here every day, at least once or twice a day to use the, the chest freezer. You know, chest freezers, are, they're so super efficient. You know, when you open up the door, the cold air stays inside. So you don't have the problem of when you open a regular door, all the, the coolness drops out on the ground. Here's, these are our cherries here. So check out these cherries. And down here below is our plums. So look at all the plums there. So rather than pack plums, we just dump them in here. I have that one right there. Here's another another space Whoa. for plums here. And these are apples, applesauce. So the apples that you see out on the ground now, the ground falls, you make those into applesauce or you dry them. I typically will have a couple of quarts of plums and then I mix that with oatmeal. Tomatoes are another great one. You just wash them, dry them, and freeze them whole like rocks. So a really important resource because it makes it so easy to preserve foods without the headache of, and heat of canning. Since we lived in the passive house and learned how important it is to super insulate, as we remodel these units in the main building, you'll notice the walls become very thick. This is the existing wall, two by four wall. It had R13 insulation or some minimal insulation that was required back in 1959 when the building was built. So we've added six inches and then we have a two by four on edge with insulation between it. So we've augmented the existing insulation, which was probably R15 or so with R30. So we're now R45. The other thing to keep in mind is what defines passive house is super insulation and airtight. By addressing those two issues, you can maintain really a nice temperature year round very, very efficiently. So you're able to do that with apartments. Yeah, then, so that's yeah. what we're doing. As we remodel apartments, we thicken the walls. And one thing I wanted to show you is the window quilts. So if you want privacy, that's another thing. It's total privacy. Better than blinds, way more energy efficient. In a house, typically your energy loss is through the windows. So when it's super cold outside, the windows are really cold and it cools the air inside. And if it's hot outside, the windows are hot and 
it's the glass which is transmitting that temperature difference. So windows are comparatively very poorly insulated. These are like R1, whereas our thickened walls are like R45 or so. So you're getting 45 times as much heat loss through your windows. So by using a window quilt, this is like a regular quilt that you'd sleep with. It increases the insulative capacity probably by several fold. So as we discover these new technologies, the passive house technology and, and window quilts, we know what we need to use when we remodel new units. So all future units are probably going to have window quilts because it's a really underutilized technology, very, very simple. As we walk along here, you can see we have some fruit trees. This is a tea house that actually one of our residents built, and it's got kind of a little landscape there, including it's got rain chains in the corner to drop the water. But the main feature that you can see right here is the kitchen compost courtyard. So this is where we probably spend more time than just about any other activity. And you'll see the pile of buckets in the center. So that's kitchen compost that people have brought from their units. Here's the kitchen compost area. So the compost, it's showing 150 degrees. That's pasteurization temperature. It takes one minute to kill all pathogens in industrial processes, 159 degrees. So our compost bins routinely get up to that temperature. So when people bring their kitchen compost out, you empty it in here and then you cover it with wood chips again. We don't want to ever see rotting compost. Uh, and then that's chopped garden refuse. So we do lasagna composting. So we'll put a layer of this and then a layer of that over and over until it's all gone. And then we finally cap with the additive. This is the same material that comes right out of our wood chip depot down below. A layer of that goes on top. So the bins always look like they're filled with wood chips, really. And uh, I noticed there is no, let's say, people tend to complain about insects. That's really rare. The big one, though, is rats. So once or twice a year, typically, we'll see excavation on the top where a rat is excavating. And by the way, rats are actually good for compost because they excavate and aerate them. But we can't, we're prohibited from harboring rats. So we tried to make as inhospitable a setup here as we possibly could. And the way that works is the tops of the bins are exposed to the sky and rats don't like to be exposed to the sky. That's where predators come from. So we don't have a problem with harboring rats. Now notice I'm going to step up into the bins and I'm just going to pull a sign here. So we actually finished this at our last Saturday work party. So it says I'm full. This bin was filled August 1st, 2021. Uh, and it takes us about seven months to go in a circle. So these three bins or these four bins actually now are full. The next one Next Saturday, we're going to do this one, and this sign here indicates that. This is the way you aerate your compost. You excavate down like that, and then you pull up, and it homogenizes and aerates the compost, which is really important because compost is a respiration. It uses oxygen. People are required to give an hour per month to communal activities. By the way, we have about 55 residents. George has been here 35 years, as he mentioned. Most have been here much less than that. We've been, Maitre and I, who started the project, we're going on 14 years now. If you've lived in an apartment, you're probably familiar with the situation where you may not know the person two doors down. Everybody knows everybody here, so that's the beauty of community. Hey, Amit. Yes. Food Hi. Not Bombs is a fantastic, they use our kitchen to prepare their weekly meal. And we have benefited so much from Food Not <laughs> Bombs. We get all their leftovers that are in the share area. Uh, and we get to contribute, too. So you moved in here because it was a nice relationship. I moved in here because there are not a whole lot of, uh, like, excellent options. People come here and they're floored, you know, and uh, we get volunteers, they come and they don't see all this. Then one day we're like, oh, we need to go composting. So we take them here and they're like, <gasps> what is that? You know, you just, 
it just you don't have that and it's not that expensive to live here uh, comparatively to the other places so this is our community courtyard here and just inside is our community room you'll notice how cool it is inside outside it's about 95 and inside it's probably 30 degrees cooler here the the advantage of living underground so uh, we have like a little gathering space here a community kitchen and then down this way when you live in a community like this and you're living in a one bedroom of apartment if you have guests coming from out of town you don't have a lot of space to put them up so it's very nice to have a guest room that belongs to everybody so if you have family coming into town put them up here and Mark Lakeman, we hired him to design a new facade for the building. And so the cupola, we've already implemented that part. We haven't put up the spires yet. We got five different spires. His commission was to turn this, what looked like a cheap hotel, into what looks more like an Asian temple. And we're gradually implementing this. The main thing that we've done so far is the cupola here in the center. You have a lot of solar. It's actually 58 kilowatts of solar, and that produces about two-thirds, maybe three-quarters of the power used by the entire building. So that's why we're talking about extending panels out in this direction. About the width of this middle building right here, if we covered that area with solar panels, that would take us to 100%. So we're probably going to create a greenhouse in that space that has solar panel roof. So that's Neil's truck right there. He has his own farmer spot. You can see just the R, it's Mark Farmer there. You can see all the cars that are parked. Now it may not happen this year, but eventually all that parking will be turned into a non-car use. So we have two community vehicles. We don't, Maitre and I do not own a personal vehicle. We've turned our vehicle over to the community and we want to get other community members to use that and sell their cars, but eventually when the spaces are depaved, they will have to either get rid of their car, or if they want to keep it, there's no reason that they can't keep it, but they'll just have to park on the street. Our neighborhood actually has a fair amount of street parking. I mean, look over there, there's a whole side of the street that has no cars in it. So America in general has a significant excess of parking, so we just need to use our resources a little bit better. So you had, when you first came, how much was asphalt? So we had 5,500 square feet of asphalt in the front yard. That was 12 parking spaces. And then along the front of this building, we depaved three and a half additional spots and created really a nice buffer for those apartments. That was basically instigated by the residents that lived there. So this was three and a half parking spots right here. The neighboring residents were fed up with the traffic lights shining in their windows and all the noise from cars. And so they said, look, can we turn this into a garden? And we'd had the experience depaving the front. So we said, why not? Let's do it. The community got together. We had several community work parties. And we depaved this, removed all the pavement, and planted this beautiful landscape. So I think the residents really like the great green buffer here now. We have a couple of shared bikes. Food Not Bombs actually has an electric cargo bike that they share. And we have a couple of bike trailers and, yeah, so here's a bike trailer here. Here's the electric cargo bike. Here's another bike trailer here. We have a little kind of a tool area and maintenance area here. And then this is our garden tool so storage. And we have, we have public hoses here and garden tools arrayed on the, the edge. So by living in community, you can get rid of a lot of personal possessions. Check out this cargo trailer. Wow, that's a really big trailer there. I see you have bees. The bees, yes. We have two or three beehives. This is the Langsdorf type of beehive. We have the top bar and the waray hives also. One of our residents, he comes from a family of beekeepers, so he gets to do all the beekeeping work. And we occasionally get a small harvest, but they serve as our pollinators here. Here are some more mason bee shelters here. They build their little mud uh, dwellings inside there. This is Caleb, our property manager. So, Hi. so when Maitre and I started this, we were property managers until a couple of years ago. And we're trying to wind down our micromanaging of the property and the day-to-day -day renting and you know people moving in and out. And Caleb now is taking care of that. Are these places easy to rent? Uh, they are, yeah. believe it or not. 
I mean, it's Portland, so yeah. you assume so. But yeah, we uh, we maintain a pretty healthy wait list, mm -hmm. uh, and when there's a vacancy, how many are on our wait list now? Is oh, it like it's probably now? it's probably in between two and three hundred okay. right now. <laughs> so it's a lot. Two and three hundred people are waiting for how many? Like yeah, so we could use Kailash Eco Village 2.0, 3.0, and uh, I think uh, people would would jump on it. Do you ever think about raising the rents? We have from time to time, but for the most part, I don't think that's really the, the end-all be-all goal of this place. So let's walk around the rear of the building. More raspberries, we got grapes coming on here. This creates a nice visual barrier between our Echo Village and the neighboring property. So this was our original community garden here. So every square inch was really important. It probably is immaterial what the rent would be. We keep our rents low despite that. I mean, we could probably double our rents, but wow. it's not our mission to make money. Have you ever heard of the notion of a squash tunnel? This is a tunnel filled with these uh, heavy duty trellis material. These are actually called cattle panels that you get at farm stores. And you just bend them in a shape like this, and then you can train squashes on this side and Bean, these are beans on this side. Hi, Monty, how are you doing? So Monty lives right there in the uh, corner okay. apartment, and okay. he, he sort of takes care of this area. And Monty, how long have you been here? Uh, oh, six and a half years now. Six and a half years. How do you, so how do you like living here? It, it's, it has a lot of all the things that you want to sort of share. So land and the ability to cooperate in different ways to form either teams or divide it up in a way to organize the sort of growing and okay. then let people go to town as opposed to there's one size that fits all and everybody's a little different. But there's a lot of challenge in it too because there's so many differences of opinion. It actually took us 13 years for the community to agree on a community decision-making process. These gardens here are the collaborative effort of the residents that live right in this area here. This is our medicinal garden right here. We have echinacea and a whole bunch of other herbs. So what was here? There's a little story here, right? Yeah, th this was the old swimming pool that was decommissioned probably five or so years before we moved into the property here. They tried to demolish the swimming pool, but it was too strongly built, so they just filled it in, and then we've turned this into a garden here. It's interesting, you can see some of the landscaping that's happening around here. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Now, this apartment complex right here, look at it though, it, it is very much like barracks. There's hardly any green space in that whole area. So between the rows of houses, there's a full width street and sidewalk. So it's a very, very sterile area. You can imagine if you were to consolidate all the housing into a smaller area, you could turn that whole area green with food forests and things like that and make really a, an area of tremendous beauty. Does it have to be more expensive to do this? Well, it's certainly a lot more maintenance. So the amount of effort that goes into our gardens is really quite astounding, but it's not work, it's play because the residents are enjoying the gardening. If you look at it from a business perspective, no business would want a complex landscape like this because it's way too much maintenance. But what you have to do is turn over the maintenance to the residents, and then they do it. They get joy. It's an antidepressant. It's a way of creating food. It's a way of creating community. So you have to do it in a certain way, but it's definitely a lot more work than the typical grass and ornamental shrub landscape for sure. Still, I mean, look at the vastness of the landscape around us. You know, there are thousands and tens of thousands of acres in Portland, so it could all be like this, potentially, uh, if people wanted it. So hopefully, as we move to the future and people become more attuned to the ecological advantages of this, we'll see more landscapes like this that are created.